Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, hope you had a good start to the show. Uh, my name is Leonard Law. I'm a product manager on the Google Cloud Platform team. And uh, in my capacity, I've had a, a privilege of working with many of our largest enterprise customers. Um, but a little bit about me. Um, before joining Google, I've worn a number of different hats. Um, I was an entrepreneur. I started a uh, sort of too early for its time social media site. I uh, was a consultant who uh, spent uh, many years working with a number of e-commerce firms. Uh, engineer building many different applications and, and technologies. And finally, for the decade prior to joining Google, I was a CIO on Wall Street. And I tell you this because I like to think that I have something in common with, with many of you in the room. Um, you know, I was in your shoes, and, and for a long time, I was uh, a prospective buyer of cloud. Now, I was interested in cloud as a CIO for quite a long time. What I realized was that I spent too much of my time and my budget on uh, the things that were necessary to keep the lights on. And inversely, I spent too little time on the things that really would give my company a competitive advantage. You know, cloud was this thing that I thought could unlock agility and, and productivity and, and innovation. But every time I tried to start up a new cloud initiative, it felt like I got a roadblock from somebody in security or compliance or risk. I want to take a quick moment to tell you a story uh, that really made the cloud value proposition real for me. So as I mentioned, I was a CIO of, a, of an investment management firm. And as you might imagine, uh, we had to hold a lot of investor records um, in our systems. Those investor records included things like names, addresses, social security numbers, um, tax IDs, you know, stuff that you would classically define as personally identifiable information. Of course, this is, is a nightmare, uh, but we worked with our auditors to come up with a strategy to secure this data. And what we did was we encrypted uh, all of that data using Windows Server 2003's encrypting file system. We set up our records management system uh, to be the only account that had access to that certificate. Of course, you can imagine that this story doesn't end well, and that certificate ended up getting corrupted. And the lessons that I learned after that were uh, pretty frightening. So fortunately, uh, we had a backup of the private key. And that backup was in uh, one of my employees' uh, personal Gmail boxes. Uh, and it turned out you know, the operations manager, really nice guy, but he was really just a glorified uh, speed dial to Microsoft support. And it was at that point that I realized that cloud was not really a nice to have. It was a requirement for me. Because at the end of the day, there was no way that my infrastructure folks uh, would become sort of a core competency for my business. And so cloud was something that was much more than just something to drive agility uh, and to, to create efficiency. It was, in fact, something that I needed uh, to reduce risk for my organization. And so you have this sort of vision of cloud. And, and cloud can be this amazing thing, right? It, it unlocks all these opportunities. You know, I like to think about it as, as Willy Wonka's chocolate factory for an IT uh, worker. You know, you can imagine this world where you know, infrastructure can scale up from zero to infinity and back on demand, right? No more headaches with procurement. You know, imagine a world where you don't have to worry about Patch Tuesday. Uh, you know, software is upgraded automatically. Uh, zero days are patched uh, on your behalf. Imagine a world where your software developers can focus on just writing code instead of trying to run infrastructure. And finally, imagine a world where I can actually make sense of all this data that I've been collecting. Uh, in short, you know, cloud for me was something that could truly transform information technology into business technology. But as you all know, it's not such a simple story. In fact, moving to cloud today can be hard. And, and so I'm going to spend the rest of this talk talking about sort of three major areas uh, that companies tend to think about when initiating their move to cloud. The first is security and compliance. And I'm going to speak here mostly about data protection. Uh, the next is on keeping operational control over a vast set of cloud resources. Uh, and the last is, how do you make sure cloud can work with my existing assets? So over the last few years, I'm sure you've seen a headline like one of these. Um, and nothing catches the attention of, of an executive or a board member like an explosive headline. Back in 2011, Experian conducted a survey uh, called the Reputation Impact of a Data Breach. 
And what they found was that the average brand lost 184 to 332 million dollars of brand value uh, when, when incurring a, a major breach. So the first thing that companies typically think about is data protection, or as I like to call it, how to keep the boss out of jail and how to avoid making the wrong headlines. So at Google, the first thing we think about when it comes to protecting data is encryption at rest. Um, and we believe this is an imperative uh, capability that is required across the entire platform. And so at Google, uh, all data is encrypted at rest by default, automatically. We also recognize, though, that customers desire amount of control over how their data is encrypted. Uh, and so we are fortunate to work with a number of customers, including those from uh, highly regulated industries, to understand sort of the trade-offs between fully automated management uh, and, and fine-grained control. Uh, and so what we've done is we've introduced a couple of new uh, features. The first is uh, key, uh, customer managed keys using our Cloud KMS. Uh, and that's a, a model that allows you to store and, and, and maintain keys in Google Cloud, uh, but also to still control things like rotation, uh, creation, revocation, and so on. And finally, uh, we created uh, customer supplied encryption keys, which is a novel uh, feature in, in a cloud platform, which actually keeps encryption keys only ephemerally in the cloud. What this means is that customers uh, can provide a key to Google and encrypt that data on their behalf using that key, but Google will never persist that key on the cloud so that any time that that data is at rest, Google has no access to decrypting that data. Now, I'm very pleased to announce, or to, sorry, to introduce uh, Patrick Lecuyer, uh, who was formerly the uh, head of IaaS and PaaS security at Morgan Stanley, and uh, now the, the head of cybersecurity at Lightspeed HQ, who was one of the customers who uh, helped us to uh, come up with some of these models. So Patrick's going to talk a little bit about um, where he thinks these use cases are appropriate. Thank you, Leonard. So. Yes, so you so used to work at Morgan Stanley, now at Lightspeed HQ, so still in closer to financial industry. Uh, at Morgan Stanley, when we started looking at moving workloads to the cloud, one of the big concerns that we had was around encryption of confidential data. And the first approach that we took was to actually try to figure out and choose the encryption controls we would put in place in terms of data classification. So standard data classification, is there public, confidential, highly restricted? And we very quickly figured out that those classic data classification are not all that relevant when you're talking about encryption controls. Because the reality is that most of your data is confidential anyway. It's, you don't have that much public data. And in order to figure out what's the best encryption control to put in place, we had to look more closely at how we wanted to protect the data. So we figured that within that large category of data that's confidential data, we actually had different concerns around different classes of data within that. And this is where the model that Google is offering is actually extremely interesting. And when we're looking at that data, and if we move from the fully automated mode all the way to the finer grain, the default encryption that Google offers actually allowed us to have basic encryption at rest. We call this the way that we called it and still call it in the e-commerce industry. That's compliance encryption. So your regulator asks you to have something that's encrypted. You can say it's encrypted. And when you look at the white papers that uh, Google publish, it's actually very well encrypted. You have a strong key management. The thing it doesn't give you is a lot of flexibility or a lot of understanding of what's happening. Encrypting is one thing, but figuring out how the data is used and figuring out how the keys are released is actually much more important than encrypting itself, especially as you want to protect against most sophisticated threat. So fine grained encryption, okay for compliance, it protects against the basic threats. It protects against physical threats on Google's infrastructure. It protects against disk-based threats. But as you move to data where you want to protect against threats that would come from somewhere else, you want to move and have more visibility over that encryption. And this is where the second model with Cloud KMS and the customer managed encryption keys actually brings you a lot more visibility. Because right now, at, at that point, 
Google does not control the keys anymore. They hold the key for you. They give you way to um, they give you co way to segregate duties, to create auditing, and to really understand how your data is used. So that's interesting because one of the major threads that we figured out we wanted to use encryption against was not all that much threads that were coming from the outside, but threads that were coming from the inside. We were more worried about our own operation people making a mistake and by mistake leaking data that we were about a sophisticated intruder trying to decrypt their data. And that's a, a concern that's really particular to the cloud because we gain a lot of agility in the cloud, but as we gain that agility, we also end up losing some control and we end up increasing risk that a mistake will happen. And we found that by using encryption and using some of the controls around Cloud KMS about how keys are released and how we can segregate duties about people who can encrypt and decrypt data, there is a way to prevent some of the accidental data leak issues that might come from the cloud. So that's very interesting. If the, for most confidential data, when you want to worry and make sure that your data will, you will gain, you will keep visibility and you will be able to keep that segregation of duties that's extremely hard to implement in cloud. It's a very good model. And then we have the data that leads to the type of headlines that was in the previous slides. So there are data, and every industry has that data that's not only confidential, but has some regulatory requirements around it. It might be your client data, it might be payment card industry data, it might be health data. It's the kind of data that if it ever gets out, you will need to answer some very hard question from your regulators. And this is where moving, again, one way up the stack and moving from a place where Google holds your key and gives you very good auditing over them to a place where you actually can manage your own key and provide the keys and keep full control over the life cycle of that keys and providing it when you make an, uh, an action and be able to scope that key release to one very specific action that one authorized user has taken allowed us to answer those questions when or if they came way more precisely because now we add full visibility over how the data was, was being used because we were the one releasing the keys. So in a context where you have regulators and you want to be able to answer very quickly, okay, there was a data breach, could it have come from the cloud provider? Could it have come from a mistake? Could it have come from an external attacker? Being able to control precisely how that key is released is actually a very, very strong control. But again, there's cost to managing your own keys. So finding that right balance really depends on those requirements and how you want to keep that visibility to that control over keys. So by looking at, at it from a threat management point of view rather than from a data classification point of view, uh, I think it allows to have a much clearer vision on how the keys should be used, should be managed. And it really allows to align very, very efficiently with that model that Google produ uh, presents. So yeah, thank you. Great. Thank you, Patrick. Um, so as Patrick described, you know, encryption is a, it's a multifaceted decision uh, that needs to be made. Uh, I encourage you all to check out uh, session IO214, Managing Encryption of Data on the Cloud. It's happening on Friday. Um, OK. So let's say we've sorted out our encryption strategy um, it's still maybe the case that we want to do a little bit more. Uh, oftentimes, we may be managing sensitive data. Uh, maybe we don't know what data is moving to the cloud, and we need to figure out how sensitive the, that data is. Uh, maybe we are uh, hosting sensitive data in the cloud, and we want to be careful uh, that that data doesn't leak out. Uh, one example might be you have an e-commerce site, uh, and uh, maybe you've built a customer service app. Uh, you want to make sure that that customer service app doesn't accidentally uh, allow a customer service agent to leak uh, PI information over online chat. Uh, for this, we have a number of partners that can help us. And some very exciting announcements that Diane mentioned uh, will be announced tomorrow. So I encourage you, again, to come out to uh, session IO218, uh, which will be happening tomorrow afternoon. And I would be remiss to talk about and any kind of enterprise migration story without uh, giving a nod to our partners. Um, so in the space of data protection, we have a, a number, you know, this is a, a selection of partners that we work with. 
Uh, for example, Ionic Security, which is a Google Ventures-backed company, uh, provides high assurance and high throughput encryption key and entitlements management solutions uh, for global organizations like Goldman Sachs, Aetna, ADP, and the Department of Defense. Uh, one of their products, Ionic Protect for Cloud Storage, uh, enables developers to simply and seamlessly use their own one-time use encryption keys uh, with the full capabilities of the Ionic platform, but integrated natively with Google Cloud Storage. Another partner, Key Nexus, provides a centralized uh, platform agnostic key management solution that can be deployed on a variety of architectures, both in the cloud and on-premise. Uh, and it helps to enable a variety of bring your own key scenarios. Uh, Key Nexus integrates directly with uh, GCP, including our G Cloud client interface uh, for Google Compute Engine, as well as the GSU Utils SDK for cloud storage. Uh, in both cases, uh, this allows customers to leverage the customer supplied encryption key functionality that I, that I talked about, but using keys uh, that are stored in Key Nexus and, and uh, allowing for uh, the rotation and federated management uh, that that platform provides. Uh, from, from here, I'd like to introduce Saul Cates. Uh, Saul is the Vice President of Technical Strategy at Talis, and he's going to spend a few minutes talking about uh, what their company brings to bear. Thank you. Hello, hello. Hello, computer. There we go. <laughs> Excellent. So as, uh, uh, as Leonard said, I'm Saul Cates. I'm the VP of Technical Strategy for Talis. Uh, prior to the acquisition, I was with a company called Vormetric, which some of you might be familiar with. Um, and I want to talk about two sort of things that are interesting to us in uh, conjunction with Google Cloud. So as most of you know, um, you know, going to cloud is a shared responsibility. I was a CISO for many years, so I also you know, agree with Leonard. Um, one of the challenges as you go to new technologies like cloud in particular, it's figuring out where the, si uh, the, the line in the sand from uh, innovation versus control perspective. How do we make sure that we're leveraging the technology effectively, getting the value we need out of it as quickly as possible, but not making sure we're not running into a burning fire. So if you guys haven't seen the Cloud Security Alliance, I highly recommend you, um, you know, t uh, research them a little bit. They have a lot of great models about how to do cloud securely, particularly when it comes to things like shared responsibilities. What is your responsibility as the buyer of this technology? What are you supposed to operate from a control perspective? All the way from SaaS platforms down to infrastructure as a service. So it's a very good resource if you haven't looked at it yet. And the reason I bring it up is I see most cloud buyers uh, traditionally either came from the IT side and not security. So when they're looking for how do I actually successfully move to cloud securely, having resources like the Cloud Security Alliance is a very, very good first step. And they've got tons of great tools for you to use. So I did actually want to talk a little bit about um, a couple of announcements that we have with Google. Um, we have just launched our, our Vormetric transparent encryption technology into the uh, test drive um, capability. So up on Obatera, so you can go check it out and actually play with a transparent encryption technology that we've been using for about 15 years to solve a fundamental problem I'll talk about here in a minute. And then we also have supported the bring your own key for the ephemeral keys that are going into the customer supplied key. So you can actually back the key material that you're using to encrypt data inside your uh, instances and drives up within Google with HSM-backed cryptography. Uh, the keys never actually leave that HSM without being wrapped and then they're, they're uh, imported into the cloud provider, in this case Google, in an ephemeral way so the data and the keys are separated. So Talus, as a company, is fairly big. We do a lot of big things. Uh, we throw stuff into space. We build aircraft carriers. But we also specialize in security. Um, and we have a fairly large portfolio. I'm going to focus on a couple things today that might be of interest, particularly on that gradient scale of security that we were just talking about uh, a couple minutes ago, everything from you know, compliance encryption all the way up to that very, very tactical, very sensitive information that I had to be very uh, concerned with. And one of the technologies I wanted to focus on is Vormetric Transparent Encryption. It's something that's been around for about 15, 16 years now. Um, and it's just because it's old doesn't mean it's bad. We sort of got the architecture the right way the first time. Um, we had designed a technology to help combat a very serious threat that we saw within the infrastructure of most IT departments, and that is root, the god of the operating system, the DBA of of the database, right? Those privileged users had unfettered access to the data. And we'll talk a little bit about why that is. 
So the transparent encryption technology um, has been around for quite a while. Uh, it focuses on just about any kind of data type, any kind of infrastructure. It can run in cloud, it can run in hybrid mode, be on physical systems, legacy platforms, next generation, container-backed applications. It's fairly flexible. We designed it to be so uh, many years ago. And as new innovations happen, we make sure that we uh, embrace and, and, and support them. And really, the, the notion is data should always be in a protected state. You know, I, I really like the, the fact that Google's taken this stance as well is, at the minimum, encrypted at rest, right? Even if it's a transparent key that's governed to your tenant, that's better than zero, right? So it's slightly better than zero. And then you need to have that gradient scale to get all the way up to that very sensitive information because I've been doing this for 15 years in, in, in different capacities in the um, encryption space. No one does encryption because they want to. Right? It's something compels them to do so. It's either a risk reduction, it's a compliance requirement, it's a government scream, you know, a customer screaming at them, some reason to change. And encryption is actually not the hardest part to do. That's the easiest thing to do. It's all the complexity around it. Key management, separation of duties, who can see this data under what conditions, so on and so forth. So we built a technology to combat the privileged user, in particular in the Unix environment at the very beginning. Uh, but then we actually had uh, enhanced it over the last 15 years to be very, very transparent and extendable. So what we do is we encrypt data at rest inside your operating systems and VMs. And again, this is just one product out of the multitude of the portfolio, because we can go all the way up to tokenization. But a lot of our organizations like to focus on need to know. Um, if you guys ever worked in the intelligence community or worked in uh, DOD or any place where you have these compartmentalizations of different types of data, you understand the concept of having the need to know or the right to know. And what we did was we built a technology that actually encrypts data at rest and then to leave that state of encryption, you have to be the right user doing the right thing the right way with the right authentication. It's a policy-based approach to saying who's the right user of this data and when should they see it. So we just launched this in uh, the test drive uh, this last week. So you can now actually go out and play with it. But what this does, it actually allows you through policy to say which users on this platform should ever see this data. And a user, nine times out of 10, is an application. All right, it's a container. Which data should I be using? Which service account should access this information? And the reason this is important is if you look at every single data breach that you've probably read about in the last five, six years, there's a common thing that happens at the very end of the data breach. Escalate privilege, steal data. Well, we took the privilege away many years ago. If you employ something like this, it allows you to get much more granular as to what and who and why information can be accessed in a um, clear way, right? The default stance is keep it protected. To leave the stance, you've got to authenticate the, the appropriate way. And then with that, uh, again, another part of the portfolio is we do a lot of key management. So uh, we've just put some investments in over the last six months or so to actually support bringing your own key into multiple cloud providers. We see a common problem here. This is sort of the way that my team works. We start with the problem, we work towards the technology. Um, there's a common problem, which is cloud key management. As uh, cloud providers such as Google are turning on more and more encryption capabilities within their uh, frameworks, the need for the enterprise to actually manage those keys is, is growing, right? It's increasing. But the challenge is, is every single provider is doing it slightly different. They have different concepts, different architectures, different APIs you work with. So we actually invest and create a technology, what we call it our uh, key management as a service, that actually allows you to back all these key managers as they evolve over, over the next couple of years from one single pane of glass with keys managed and stored on-prem. So you have that flexibility of bursting in the cloud using those infrastructure, that service, those you know, PaaS applications that you would like to, and ground it in key material and governance that's done on-prem in traditional HSMs and in, of course, our data security manager, which is part of the Vormetric portfolio. And with that, thank you. And if you want to come chat, we have a booth here, uh, C3. Thank you. Great. Thanks, all. OK. So let's assume that we've made some decisions around data protection. The next thing that, uh, that really scares a lot of people is how do we manage these, these resources at scale, right? Um, one of the nightmares that I used to have is of the 100-tab the spreadsheet that my auditors gave me for SOX compliance. And imagine applying that spreadsheet to the sort of limitless and elastic resources that are afforded to you in cloud. It's, it's not a good place to be. Uh, and so clearly, 
uh, being able to manage resources at scale is imperative to, to controlling the risk as you uh, move into the cloud environment. And so uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of things. Uh, you know, the first step that you want to take uh, when you're trying to control resources in Google Cloud is to start with the access management patterns that you're going to apply to your resources. And so what you can do is in Cloud IAM, uh, you can set up fine-grained roles and permissions uh, that define the, the patterns that can, be act that can access uh, your cloud resources. Next, by grouping those resources into our resource hierarchy, uh, you can create some organizational constructs. And that logical uh, grouping allows you to then apply uh, those, those, uh, those access management policies in an inherited way. And finally, at the top level, um, we have these organization-wide policies that can help you to create uh, limits that enforce uh, certain constructs within your Cloud Platform deployment. Uh, for example, you might want to create a policy that says, uh, under no circumstances should a user be able to have serial port access to a compute engine instance. And that's something you would set at a, at a high level policy level. And we be believe very much in sort of a belt and suspenders model uh, for security. And so in addition to being able to set the policy, we want to be able to verify the activity that's happening. And so GCP provides very robust audit logging capabilities, uh, which keeps track of both your administrative and potentially data access uh, events uh, that are happening on Google Cloud. Again, there's going to be a much deeper dive on, on this topic. Uh, please check out session IO211 uh, for how to control your uh, organization's cloud resources. It's going to be a good session. Um, I want to go back to partners again here. Uh, in this particular space, I think partners are, are especially important. Uh, as customers are looking at hybrid cloud and multi-cloud worlds, it's, it's very likely that they have resources not just in GCP, but also spread across uh, multiple infrastructures. Um, so take, for example, Qualys. Uh, Qualys provides their virtual scanner appliance for GCP, which extends the same multi-layered security that customers are used to running in their own data centers to Google Cloud. Uh, users can now scan GCP resources using both multi-cloud and on-premise assets uh, from within the Qualys Cloud. The virtual scanner appliance is certified by Google and can now be directly deployed from the Google Cloud launcher. Uh, users can also embed the Qualys Cloud agents directly into their GCE images uh, for a continuous view on security and compliance events. Uh, another partner that I'm excited to talk about is Brinka. Brinka uh, has a cloud sale cybersecurity risk management uh, tool for GCP. Uh, with Brinka, customers uh, get comprehensive visibility into their cloud and data center resources, uh, along with the ability to measure and manage risk across several key security concerns like asset inventory, vulnerability management, policy compliance, and privileged, privileged access monitoring. Uh, the Brinker Risk Platform uh, analyzes data from both native GC GCP APIs as well as best of breed uh, assessment services across the Google Cloud Platform ecosystem, uh, which can give you complete visibility, insight, and command over cybersecurity and uh, is going to be available in Cloud Launcher very soon. Uh, and then finally, MetricStream has an IT GRC solution, uh, which provides customers with a great end-to-end -end solution that enables them to scope, plan, and achieve cloud asset security, transparency, governance, and compliance. Um, so as customers expand into the cloud, uh, particularly with multi-cloud and hybrid cloud deployments, uh, partners like these are invaluable to helping to maintain uh, operational governance over uh, your technology portfolio. I'd like now to introduce uh, Roy Feintuch to the stage. Uh, Roy is the CTO of Dome9, uh, which is another very interesting company uh, who's working with Google Cloud. I think you're going to use this. Thank you, Leonard. And thank you for not messing up my name. <laughs> I'll deal with the second. Okay. So. Uh, we started our journey to the cloud, to cloud security, more than six years ago, where my partner, Zora, and myself try to reimagine what does it mean to create an infrastructure security service, but purpose-built into the cloud. Six years later, fast forward to now, Domini Security is protecting some of the largest and most complex cloud environments within Amazon and Azure. And our announcement is, as of today, we've got uh, uh, announcing the availability of the Dome 9 Arc platform to GCP customers as well. So what does it bring to you? And I would like to start with some uh, question. 
Um, how many of you are familiar with this uh, unicorn piglet? <laughs> well, not too many, but uh, uh, this toy, uh, it's, it's called Cloud Pets, is a cloud-enabled toy which allows kids to talk with their family members. Uh, it was announced last week that that company, uh, Spiral Toys, had leaked over two million of audio recordings of kids talking with their family together with some personal information. And that's kind of just one incident out of tens of thousands of incidents during last quarter where the kind of common denominator was some data store, it's mostly the open source, but this doesn't really mean, MongoDB server, Elasticsearch server, being deployed to the public cloud, set there, not properly configured, totally accessible from the entire internet, and then with some lack of uh, authentication or not too strong authentication, it was hijacked by, uh, by attackers and then ransomware, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And that kind of leads me to the, to the first issue with maintaining workloads in the cloud, the operational visibility. What's my network exposure? Uh, what's my DMZ? And where are my, uh, my IT assets at all? And even if we identify a specific critical element, like this MongoDB server, what's the effective security posture, network security posture of that element? With that, I would like to show you uh, the DOM9 system and how we help protecting against these kind of issues. Let's switch to the demo. Okay, so what you're seeing now is, uh, is one of the capabilities of the platform, which is, uh, it's called Clarity, which now connects natively to the GCP APIs, process all the workloads, configuration policies, and then builds this kind of visual map of your assets and their, uh, and their exposure. So right now, trying to understand what is my DMZ, is as simple as just looking at this swim lane of the DMZ or clicking on this internet node and, uh, and seeing all the members, all my assets that are exposed directly to the entire internet. So kind of understanding that I have this uh, Mongo member here uh, with public IP address and this port TCP 27.0.17, the MongoDB port, uh, talking with the rest, with the entire internet is now a trivial, a trivial thing. Now, that system also allows you to understand and analyze the firewall rules, uh, the GCP firewall rules and the subnets in order to really understand how different assets communicate between, between themselves. So really allowing you to tighten this micro-segmentation. Micro it's a nice buzzword. So tighten this up and really make sure you've got your uh, security uh, interconnectivity between your intercomponents kind of hard enough. Let's move back to the presentation. Okay, the next topic I would like to touch is compliance and governance. Um, although this is uh, an old topic, but transferring that into the cloud brings new challenges. So how do I adhere to my existing compliance regulations? PCI, HIPAA, you name it. And on top of that also, how do I adhere to my internal corporate IT policies? So, uh, and how do I translate those, those policies to my GCP environment? So, I would like to introduce you to the DOM9 compliance engine, which is an automated compliance and governance system that allows you to test your GCP project, your GCP environments against industry best practices, against uh, compliance regulations, and internal, your own custom internal IT policies. Let's see that in action. Switch to the demo, please. Okay, so here we've, uh, we are seeing the compliance and governance view in the GCP, uh, sorry, in the DOM9 art platform. And we're gonna pick from a uh, uh, from number of, uh, uh, of policies, we call them bundles, uh, just container for rules. And I'll test the, uh, I'll, I'll take the best practices for GCP bundle, and I would like to run an assessment against one of my uh, GCP projects. So now, DOM9 in the background 
performing hundreds of tests against my assets and my policies, and almost in less than 10 seconds gave me that, uh, that report. Let me drill down into the failed tests and into the uh, high severity ones, and I can see that I have this uh, Mongo member backup in the uh, Western Union kind of automatically detected uh, uh, by, this, by the system. Uh, as I promised, it's not only testing against DOM9 best practices or industry best practices. It can also allow, uh, allow you to model your own uh, best practices, your own internal IT, uh, uh, IT policies, and model them in the cloud. So I just, as, as a, just an example, I created a little policy uh, with only two tests that allows my instances, let me try to increase that, allows my instances to only operate on specific US uh, regions or uh, uh, that no firewall rule should allow SSH to the entire internet. Now these rules, those policies are created in what we call GSL, the governance specification language, which allows you to create something like English, SQL uh, kind of statements and that allow you to, re uh, to create your own specific custom governance tool. Back to the presentation. So if you'd like uh, to hear more about, uh, about the product, we are here. We have a nice team here uh, at booth 820. Uh, feel free to give us a visit. We are kind of uh, friendly people there. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Roy. OK. So to recap, we've talked about data protection. Uh, we've talked about applying some operational control to your environment. Uh, the next thing tip companies typically think about is, well, how is this all going to work with my existing infrastructure? Um, you know, companies have made existing investments in infrastructure and data centers. Um, you have relationships with key partners in ISVs. Uh, and you want to make sure that everything plays nicely together. And you want to make sure also uh, that you're not getting locked into any decision you make. Um, so the first step is typically to extend your network into Google Cloud Platform. And uh, we have a number of ways that you can do this. Uh, we have Carrier Interconnect, uh, which provides enterprise-grade uh, connections to Google using Interconnect Carrier Service Provider Partners. Uh, you can also do direct peering, uh, which allows you to connect directly to Google uh, for high levels of traffic. Uh, and then we're uh, very soon this year going to be uh, rolling out Private Interconnect and Partner Interconnect, uh, which allows easy RFC 1918 uh, private addressing uh, to be used on GCP. Of course, all of your data and all of your internet connections can be secured via VPN, uh, and you can segment off uh, your network from the outside world in our virtual private cloud. Um, I could spend kind of all day talking about network, but uh, there are actually three sessions that I would direct you to in this case. Um, IO210 is actually happening right now. So if it's uh, of interest to you, please check out the replay. Uh, otherwise, IO344 uh, is a, a, a blueprint on security for uh, your workloads. That's happening tomorrow at 11. Uh, and IO401 is a, a view on our VPC strategy. And that's happening today at 4 o'clock. Um, again, when you talk about hybrid cloud, uh, there are a number of partners that are very important in this space. Uh, for example, CloudStrike. Uh, CloudStrike, uh, you know, as organizations move their sensitive uh, data and computing capabilities to Google Cloud Platform, uh, they need to protect the endpoints uh, in a hybrid environment. So CloudStrike has a Falcon platform, uh, which is a next generation endpoint protection and enables customers to seamlessly migrate their on-prem security to the cloud. Uh, Falcon is a cloud native ecosystem and provides continuous threat protection from malware, uh, non-malware threats uh, on endpoints and servers regardless of where they're physically located, be they on the network uh, or hosted in GCP. Uh, likewise, Trend Micro uh, has a deep security hybrid cloud solution, which enables organizations to securely move uh, to the Google Cloud Platform without compromising security. It helps organizations meet their shared responsibility in the cloud by offering DevOps-friendly workload protection, uh, uniform security visibility and management of on-prem virtualized public cloud and multiple security controls to speed compliance, virtually patch against vulnerabilities, and proactively defend against network and application threats. Um, and I want to sort of wrap up the talk uh, on Google's philosophy on, on open source and open APIs. Um, this is absolutely critical to, uh, to our story. Um, 
you know, recent research suggests that 82% of enterprises have a hybrid cloud strategy. Uh, and that includes 1.5 public and 1.7 private clouds. And Google Cloud's vision is to really help customers to succeed in an open multi-cloud world. Um, you know, over our history, we've released over 20 million lines of code, projects like Chromium, TensorFlow, Kubernetes, and so on. Uh, and we've incubated a number of other projects which have led to innovations like Hadoop, uh, HBase, and so on. So it's this devotion to uh, open source and open APIs uh, that means that customers can continue to drive, drive innovation uh, without feeling locked into Cloud Platform. You know, you can bring your applications to cloud, uh, but you can also run those same applications uh, on premise or in another cloud. And we believe that being open is the best way uh, to achieve these hybrid and multi-cloud strategies. And we're committed to helping customers uh, to leverage these architectures in a flexible and low-risk way. Uh, so with that, um, you know, I just wanted to tell everyone again that we're committed to helping to get your uh, journey to be secure to Google Cloud Platform. 